Hi, I'm Alex Jordan from Long Color Grading and FilmSimplified.com. This video is going to be very different from the kind of videos I usually do. But if you like to learn about the history of things, I think you will love to learn about the fascinating history of DaVinci Resolve. Let's start. In 2009, uh, Blackmagic Design acquired DaVinci Systems, uh, the owner of DaVinci Resolve. After Blackmagic Design acquired DaVinci Systems, they sold two DaVinci Resolve units. This is a quote from the press release. Blackmagic Design announced today that the world-leading post-production facility Smoke & Mirrors has purchased two DaVinci Resolve R360 systems at IBC 2009. One DaVinci Resolve will be installed in the company's London facility and the other DaVinci Resolve will be installed in their New York facility. Smoke & Mirrors will be using their new DaVinci Resolve R360 systems for cutting-edge television commercials and music videos keeping the company at the leading edge of creative workflows in their international markets. So they were very proud that they sold two units of Resolve, and they said that was these two units of Resolve will be serving the international market. As you can see from the press release, uh, Resolve have always been uh, serving the high end of the market. Owning Resolve used to cost more than some plain models. Uh, in certain configurations, the price of Resolve used to get up to $800,000. And at the time, Resolve did not include most of the modern features that we love and use now. Just think about that. Uh, some of the biggest movies in history were uh, done using Resolve. I just wonder how do the people who bought uh, two units of Resolve for $800,000 each back in the day uh, feel now? So let's dive into the uh, interesting history of DaVinci Resolve. Before we start, um, a disclaimer, uh, researching 80s stuff, especially when it comes to products and companies, is, is a bit tricky. Not a lot of information are available. So if you have any extra information, please uh, feel free to share them in the comments. So where does the story begin? Florida in the early 80s. Videotape Associates, uh, VTA, was a post-production uh, company based in Florida. They mainly produced commercials. And one day, they felt like they needed to buy uh, an advanced color control system to use on their uh, productions. Um, however, there was one problem. The system they wanted to buy did not exist. So they did what any one of us would do. They just simply started developing their own system for internal use. They must needed this system real badly, you know, to start developing it themselves. It's like a production house today needing a particular camera, so they start developing the camera that they need. I'm sure it still happens, but it's it's rare. So were they able to develop the system that they wanted to develop? Absolutely, yes. In 1982, they released the Wiz. It had secondary color correction back in 1982, and uh, it had a dedicated control panel. Uh, legend goes that it was built using an Apple computer, and only about 15 units were ever built. So where did this WIS system go? I mean, why don't we have it anymore? Well, in two years, in 1984, uh, the WIS was developed so much that it looked really different from the original WIS that was introduced two years earlier, so it was rebranded to DaVinci. And this is where the first time we see the DaVinci name. Note, the product was called DaVinci. However, the company itself that owned uh, the product that is called DaVinci uh, was still VTA or Videotape Associates. Of course, it was very expensive, but this is where the DaVinci name started. Note that there was no Resolve yet. This is where we get the name DaVinci for a product. This was big news. This was like the introduction of the first car ever. Uh, I'm not sure what model that was, but just, you know, work with me here. So we, uh, the first car that we introduced, maybe it wasn't the most powerful, the best car ever, but it was a proof of concept and it paved the way for other cars. And this was exactly what happened with the introduction of the first DaVinci system. Maybe it wasn't the most powerful, even though it was extremely powerful for its time, but it simply paved the way for more developments and it proved the concept. Speaking of Resolve, if you're a beginner and you're interested in learning how to use Resolve, you'll love our free crash course that will teach you the basics of every tab in Resolve. Simply go to filmsimplified.com and sign up for free. So until this time in 1984, or at least early 1984, uh, we had VTA the company owning uh, DaVinci the product. So when did DaVinci system as a company 
uh, come to be. It was also in 84, but late 1984, where uh, the R&D uh, department of VTA was rebranded into uh, Da Vinci Systems and it was spun off from the main company. Then in 1986, Dynatech Video uh, Group acquired Da Vinci Systems from VTA. So now the company, Da Vinci Systems, is owned by Dynatech. Just a note here, in 1988, Dynatech, the company that bought uh, Da Vinci Systems, changed their name to Acternal. So now you have Acternal as a parent company owning many smaller companies less like a holding company owning other companies one of the companies it owns is da vinci systems da vinci systems as a company introduced the da vinci classic as a product and the da vinci 2k later you have to keep in mind da vinci systems at that time had very strong brand recognition in January 1987, Millimeter Magazine published an article titled, The Producer's Choice. Millimeter conducted a client survey asking producers across the U.S. what equipment interested them most. Da Vinci's rating was 4.8%. To place this rating in perspective, the entire highly respected Sony broadcast product line combined rated 3.2%. There were no telecine... Even though it was very primitive by today's standard, uh, filmmakers around the world really loved the system. And they kept on developing the Da Vinci products. In, in 1991, uh, the uh, Da Vinci Renaissance 888 was introduced. It was the first system in the world to do digital 888 uh, signal processing, something that is still very advanced even by today's standards. Then in 1992, uh, power windows and custom curves were introduced. Remember, we're still on the Da Vinci Classic. There is no resolve here. This technology was unbelievably advanced for its time. I mean, for the very privileged few who managed to lay their eyes on this technology, I'm sure it was very hard to explain it for others. Next, in 2000, the blur uh, effect was added to the Da Vinci system. Then in 2000, there were more acquisitions. However, this time it was Da Vinci system acquiring another company. They acquired Nirvana Digital, which means that at that point, they owned the Revival system. That's big news. But before we explain the revival system, let's first take a look at what's happening at this point. So now you have Da Vinci Systems, the company, owning the Da Vinci products, so the Da Vinci 2K and Classic, and they also own the revival lineup now. So they have two different lines of products. Now, what's revival? As the name implies, it's it's simply a very advanced system that is designed to uh, uh, restore old footage. So. Um, things like removing dust, removing scratches, uh, removing uh, a shake from old footage. It's designed to revive old footage. Uh, the product was very expensive and very impressive. Uh, however, later it was incorporated into Resolve itself. So every time you use dust removal and Resolve, remember these uh, effects are coming directly from uh, the incorporation of the revival system into Resolve. And the development of the DaVinci systems continue. Uh, in 2001, uh, the gallery and power grades were introduced into Da Vinci systems, which is a bit weird because if you think about it, these are some of the two most important features and it's some of the, these, these two features actually get people to switch from other systems to resolve. They're unbelievably important. And at one point they weren't even in, in, in Da Vinci systems at all. Um, it's like someone saying, uh, yeah, and at what point uh, we introduced the fourth wheel to a car? I'm like, what? There was no fourth wheel before? That's how important these features are, but they were introduced in 2001. Then, 2003 was very shaky for Da Vinci Systems. You see, the parent company of Da Vinci Systems simply declared bankruptcy which got everybody worried for Da Vinci Systems because if the parent company ceases to exist, then one of the possibilities is that a lot of filmmakers around the world who really use Da Vinci Systems and rely on Da Vinci Systems might lose access to these systems uh, and we might have never seen Resolve in the future. So that was very scary for everyone uh, because you know if the parent company is going through bankruptcy, things might be a bit shaky. However, the Resolve system was, uh, not Resolve, sorry, the Da Vinci system was extremely important and extremely powerful that the development continue even through the bankruptcy. And at the same time in 2003, the world got a glimpse of the first iteration 
of Resolve. Note that it was not available for purchase yet. No one can purchase the Resolve system. However, we saw a glimpse of the new system that will be introduced. Now, Resolve, we will get why in a bit, but Resolve is really different from any other system that came before it. We'll understand why in a bit, but just keep that in mind. Um, if this was a movie, it's, it would be exactly like that scene where there's fire in the building and then the hero emerges from the middle of the fire, you know. There was this bankruptcy, a lot of uncertainty, and then Resolve walks out of the building in slow motion, you know, you know these kind of things. So that was the first time we heard the word Resolve. In 2005, uh, Resolve was officially released. Now, let's get back into what makes Resolve different. Resolve was a software-based system, so it can run theoretically on any normal home-based desktop PC without the need for specialized hardware, which is completely different than the systems that came before it. You see, all the systems that came before Resolve required specialized hardware. That So the hardware can only, so the computer, it's, it's like a special computer, that's all what it is. But this computer cannot run anything but uh, the 2K software, the DaVinci 2K software, for example. And the DaVinci 2K software can only run on this hardware. It cannot run on your regular home-based PC. However, Resolve took a different approach. Resolve got all the great features that people love about the 2K. And they've rewritten everything from the ground up that for the first time, there is the potential of it running on a home PC. Because remember, it was 2005 and PCs weren't that powerful back then. So even though Resolve can theoretically run on a PC, it ran actually on multiple PCs, expensive PCs chained together. So the system was still very expensive to operate. But as a theory, as a concept, for the first time, we have a DaVinci system that might run on a Windows or a Mac computer in the future. And that was big news. There was this shot in, in a movie for Jim Carrey, I can't remember the name of the movie, where he um, uh, looks at a beautiful woman and he asks her, what are the chances of me and you getting together? And she said, 1%. And he looked at her and he was like, I still have a chance? He was very happy about the 1%. And that's exactly what happened with Resolve at the time. Yes, it had no market traction. Yes, the hardware was not there to uh, support it. So it cannot really run on, on home-based PCs. But... This 1% was a paradigm shift. It was very important for the future. Then in 2005, the Da Vinci Systems Company switched hand one more time. It was bought by a company called JDS, which manufactured lasers and uh, other equipment for the internet's infrastructure. I'm not sure if that's correct. I didn't really get their business correct. But anyway, JDS bought... Uh, da Vinci Systems, and uh, it was owned by them. For some reason, I find that fascinating that a laser company, or a company that manufactured laser at one, as one of its businesses owned Resolve for a while. I'm not sure why do I find that fascinating, but it's, it's pretty cool. And they continued developing Resolve, of course, and in 2008, they, uh, uh, they, they released the Impresario uh, uh, control panel, which was very, very expensive, but technically it's still the same main panel we use today. Remember, at this point, Resolve still cost up to uh, uh, $800,000, but that, of course, in particular configurations. Usually, it's much cheaper. You can get your hand on Resolve by paying like $250,000 only at the time. It, it wasn't that expensive. But it can get up to $800,000, but if you have $250,000, you can totally use Resolve. Then, in 2009, the Big Bang happened. Blackmagic Design acquired DaVinci Systems. They uh, announced that they will stop developing and selling all the other systems other than Resolve. So the DaVinci Classic, 2K, everything was going. They're, they're not going to be developing anything else other than Resolve. And they uh, pledged to uh, increase the R&D uh, budget for Resolve and have more engineers working on it. Uh, I think uh, they kept their promise. In one of the interviews, the CEO said that they cannot believe that they bought such a legendary brand. 
However, fun fact here, Black Magic Design used to be a customer of DaVinci Systems. They actually owned two DaVinci Resolve systems. They said that it was through them contacting uh, DaVinci Systems all the time and asking them for new features to be added. Uh, it, it was through these conversations that they learned that, that uh, DaVinci was for sale. And of course, they bought it, like anyone would do. Just imagine you being frustrated with the features of your car, and then you go, you know what, I'm going to buy the car company and make the car much better. That's what anyone, uh, that, that would any responsible person would do. Now let's zoom out a bit. Let's take a look at the big picture. Uh, let's take a look at the product that was acquired by Blackmagic Design. The Vinci Resolve used to cost up to $800,000, and it had around 100 clients worldwide. Yeah, I know companies who used to travel all over the world just for the privilege of coloring uh, their uh, films with, with the Vin using DaVinci Resolve because it wasn't available in many countries. So if you were based in a country where there was no Resolve system, you had to travel uh, to another country that had a Resolve system and, and work there. That's how rare and important they were. However, we have to remember something very important here. Resolve is like a Lamborghini. Even though not a lot of people own Lamborghinis, a lot of people want Lamborghinis, and they're very, very familiar with the brand, with how a Lamborghini look. They always dream about owning a Lamborghini, but they don't. However, they're very aware of its existence. That's exactly the position of Resolve at the time. So at the time, a big debate started. Uh, two groups of filmmakers emerged. Uh, one of them believed that um, Black Magic Design will never lower the price of DaVinci uh, Resolve. And there was another team of filmmakers who thought, no, of course the price will go down. And they actually had their hopes up that the price might even go down to $50,000. This is a quote from uh, the CEO of Black Magic Design from the time. I don't think that can be lowered in price much. However, over the next few years as technology advances, this might happen a little. Now, the group that thought that uh, the price will never go down were proven very, very wrong, but I'm sure they are very happy now that they were proven wrong at the time. One of the most important things that Blackmagic did at the time once they acquired Resolve was to release uh, a version of Resolve that works on Mac. We have here at the show a technology demonstration of running the Resolve application on a MacBook Pro, and it's here just for colors to take a look at and give us some feedback and see what they think. Until that time, uh, yes, it's true, uh, Resolve was built for conventional PCs, but it only worked on Linux systems. So there was no Mac and no Windows version. Uh, they started by releasing a, a version for uh, Mac uh, because uh, I read in one of the interviews or heard in one of the interviews is that they believed that, yes, absolutely, there are more PCs in the world than there are Macs. But at the time, uh, I'm not sure if this is true at the moment, but at the time, um, creative people, uh, for the most part, used Macs. Then in 2011, Blackmagic Design reduced the price. Uh, there was no free version of Resolve yet. So they introduced, they had two price points. They lowered the price of the hardware-based system, so the uh, panel, to $30,000, and they introduced a $1,000 software-only version of Resolve. But remember, there was no free version of Resolve yet, so the only two options you had was $1,000 or $30,000. Now, this might look like a lot, but uh, compared to how much Resolve cost just a couple of years uh, before, this is an unbelievable reduction in price. Just think of it this way. If someone gave you a Lamborghini for $20,000, yes, $20,000 is absolutely a lot of money, but remember, you're getting a Lamborghini for $20,000. That's a bargain. And in an interview with SOS Magazine on YouTube, uh, one of the uh, uh, team of Black Magic Design said something very interesting. I mean, we've got a, um, a $995 solution for Mac, um, for the MacBook Pro, um, using exactly the same software as the high-end Linux system, but limited to one GPU. And that's a really significant price drop for using the DaVinci system, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, obviously the, the price point is, is something that we've worked very, very hard to, to try and bring down. Um, we understand that as the market develops and as, as, as people start to gain more interest into the color grading, the color grading area of this industry, that they need to be able to get their hands on it and work with it to be able to understand it better. 
Now the problem that you have is that if you haven't got $200,000, $300,000 in your back pocket, it's going to become very, very difficult to achieve that. What's nice with this is that for $1,000, you can buy some software, you can start to learn it, you can start to work out how the features work within a color grading system, start to enhance the quality of your work, and then one day you may move up to that $300 system. Or in our case, if you buy the actual Linux system, it may only cost you $85,000. And at the time he was discussing why did they introduce a $1,000 version, which was, which was considered like really, really cheap at the time. And I think this is the same pattern that happened with the computer industry before. Uh, uh, the more, if no one knows how to use a computer, no one would buy a computer. So simply, the more people know how to, uh, or at least learn how to use a computer, the more computers will be sold. And this means that computers will become cheaper just because of the economy of scale. So educating more people about a particular topic will drive its prices down, at least in theory, which I think what happened here with, um, with DaVinci Resolve. Then in 2011, DaVinci Resolve released DaVinci Resolve, Black Magic Design released DaVinci Resolve Lite, a free version of DaVinci Resolve, which in the beginning did not do well at all because there was a problem. You see, the free version of Resolve lacked many features at the time. Like, for example, it was only limited to SD and HD, so there was no 4K. It can only utilize one GPU. It didn't have noise reduction. However, the biggest problem is that Blackmagic Design limited the free version of Resolve to two color correction nodes only. So if you're using DaVinci Resolve Lite at the time, you can only use two nodes. That's not bad. However, this really limited the adoption of the software as people were not willing to deal with uh, two nodes only. It still had the great colors, the unbelievable tracker. So I remember when the first time I downloaded the free version of Resolve, I was on the phone with someone and I, I remember he hated me for that later because I was like, once that Resolve got downloaded, I was actually with him on the phone and without saying bye or anything, I just was well, like, I hang up. I, I couldn't believe that now I was in my bedroom and I had DaVinci Resolve with me uh, in the bedroom. I felt weird. And in the same year, uh, late 2011, uh, Blackmagic Design decided to lift this one limitation and now the free version of Resolve can utilize as many nodes as, as required and the floodgates open. Everybody wanted to use Resolve. Remember, at the time, Resolve was limited to color grading only. It couldn't do editing, it couldn't do anything else. It was simply a color grading tool, but it was simply the most advanced in the world. And Blackmagic Design uh, kept their word, so the development of Resolve continued. So in, so I'm just looking at the timeline here. Uh, in 2011, with Resolve 8, they released uh, a multi-layer timeline. Then in 2011, they released Resolve for Windows. Now, that was big news because the Windows system has a much larger variety of GPUs. You see, before, uh, the, the Resolve system was locked to uh, um, Mac and Linux, which both had a very limited set of supported GPUs uh, at the time. Um, but once you move to Windows, you have a very large variety of GPUs supported by Windows, which simply means that uh, now filmmakers can either decide to save money by using lower-end GPUs, or they can decide to uh, get really powerful GPUs that might not be available on the Mac or Linux side. And one of the other big things at the time is that uh, 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 th when you buy Resolve, you get a license for Resolve, regardless of what uh, platform you use it on. So the same license is good for a Mac or a PC. Because remember, that was these were the stone ages of, of software. So at the time, if you buy a particular software for a Windows PC and you want to use it on a Mac, you needed to buy another license. However, uh, Blackmagic Design decided that the same license can work for both systems, no problem at all, which was very advanced for its time and a lot of people couldn't believe that. And this was very beneficial for the adoption of Resolve because the introduction of Resolve on, on Windows meant that more people can simply use Resolve now because they already own PCs. 
Uh, as we all know, especially back then, there were always more PCs than Macs. Then in 2012, Resolve 9 was released and it introduced the light box uh, view. Um, uh, however, the interface still looked very uh, intimidating for beginners. Resolve, the original Resolve interface did not look very uh, welcoming. So a lot of people, when they used to open Resolve at the time, it looked really scary. Then in 2013, uh, Resolve 10 was introduced. Sorry, I'm reading from the screen. I can't memorize all this. Uh, the Edit tab was introduced in Resolve 10 for the first time, and it it just became very more prominent. It existed before, but in Resolve 10, the Edit tab started to become its own thing. Uh, also, sp the Split Screen Viewer was introduced, and the support for Magic Lantern Cinema DNG was introduced in Resolve 10 in 2013. So here's the deal. I'm not going to get into the history of uh, Magic Lantern Cinema DNG. However, it's very fascinating. Just Google it. It's uh, for people who weren't really in the film uh, production at the time, they, they, these were very, very exciting years. And at the same time, in, in 2013 in Resolve 10, the interface was redesigned or overhauled in a big way to make it more appealing for beginners. So it, they were trying to make it less intimidating and it really worked. The interface looked way more polished than the versions that came before it. Also in 2013, uh, Blackmagic Design decided to make Resolve Lite capable of editing uh, 4K. So now the free version of Resolve can edit up to 4K, which was and still is big news until this day. However, there was a sad part to it. it the, Black Magic Design received a lot of criticism uh, because a lot of people were angry because the, the Resolve Lite did not support the flavor of 4K that they liked. And they wanted the free version to uh, support the particular flavor that they want to produce of 4K. Um, I find I found and I still find that very disturbing until this day because you have this group of people who are totally capable of producing 4K in 2013 so they can afford the cameras, the production, the media, everything, but they cannot afford a copy of DaVinci Resolve for $1,000 at the time, but still, I mean, you're producing 4K end to end in 2013 and they were very angry about the particular flavor that Resolve Lite decided to uh, to support but Resolve Lite supports 4K that was big news then they continued to develop Resolve in 2014 uh, Resolve 11 was released which which introduced uh, grouping shots um, support for third party uh, open effects plugins uh, keyframe interpolation audio crossfade trim start and trim end independent track heights you will notice that a lot of these things are geared towards editing the editing was starting to become more powerful in Resolve however one of the biggest changes i think that happened at the time was that they moved the the monitor and the color tab from the left side to the middle uh, it's a small thing but for me it signaled that resolve is trying to cater now for beginners because here's the deal the position of the monitor on the left side is not very um, comfortable however professionals never used the monitor really it was just there for like just to look at it because all professionals had the budget to really send the image from, uh, you know, from the computer directly to an external monitor. So the position of the monitor on the uh, color page wasn't very important. However, black magic design by moving the monitor to the middle, they made it more comfortable for beginners to use the color page without needing uh, to use an external monitor. Uh, so you can just use it on your computer. Now, that was a very small thing, but for me, it signaled that Resolve was moving in the right direction now. They were catering Resolve more towards beginners who didn't have the budget uh, to use an external monitor, so they were making it much easier to use. And the introduction of all these editing features got people very excited about the possibility of editing inside Resolve. Uh, and this was very well illustrated with one of when one of my favorite YouTubers at the time. I'm not sure what, why did they stop making YouTube videos. It's a channel called Next Wave DV run by uh, Tonya Reale. Um, he actually asked this question for Black Magic Design. So is Resolve then a viable editor? It's one of those things where it does not have every feature that every editing software has. So we've really kind of shied away from calling it a full-blown editing software. And notice that Blackmagic Design shied away from calling it an editor at the time, because even though 
at the time they introduced a lot of editing features. It still lacked some important features at the time, but it was definitely building just little by little, you know, for, for Resolve to become a real editor. Do you know that this music from the Jaws uh, movie, you know, the doom, 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 this music, just just hear this music in, in, your, in your head while, while I say the next uh, sentence. Uh, uh, in 2014, Black Magic Design acquired Fusion. Now play that music, dum 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 dum. You know when when you hear that, that's exactly how it felt. Now, Fusion is one of the most. It, it was owned by a company called Aeon Software. Um, they actually um, Fusion was used on most of the top end Hollywood pr production uh, films. It's it's basically a compositor. It's one of the most powerful compositors in the world, and it was acquired by Black Magic Design in 2014. And Black Magic Design made a version of Fusion available for free. Uh, now, um, Fusion was still its own software, so uh, Fusion was not a part of DaVinci Resolve at the time. It was a standalone software that was not a part of Resolve. However, uh, uh, other than creating uh, a, a free version of Fusion, uh, Blackmagic Design also created some sort of a way to link projects between both. So you can send your edits directly from Resolve to Fusion and Fusion to Resolve. So they worked together, but they were still two separate softwares. By the way, did you know that you can go to filmsimplified.com and sign up for our free DaVinci Resolve Crash Course where you can learn the basics of each tab in Resolve? Simply go to filmsimplified.com and sign up for free. Then the development of Resolve continues. So in 2015, we had Resolve 12 that added uh, multicam, uh, you know, uh, window. And at the same time, uh, a weird version of Resolve appeared on the Apple App Store. So if at the time, if you buy uh, DaVinci Resolve through the Apple App Store only for Mac, you can get it for $500 only. Remember at the time, um, Resolve was still for a thousand dollars, the paid version of Resolve. Uh, that was a weird arrangement, but uh, I remember telling a lot of people to buy it at the time. However, with version 12, there was this thing that happened. Black Magic Design went ex the extra mile uh, and, and they really started supporting something called OpenCL. Now, you don't want to know what OpenCL is, but it meant that for the first time, DaVinci Resolve can run on lower systems than we used to before. At the same time, it had more editing feature. I mean, just had multi, it just had multi-cam added. And that's when two videos were released. There was this video by Dave Dugdale. All right, here's my thought. Premiere Pro is strong in editing, while Resolve is very strong in color. Now, it might be a while till Premiere Pro color gets as good as Resolve is in color right now. So my bet is that the NLE, the editor that's built in Resolve, will improve faster than the color in Premiere Pro. The prediction they've made in that video held true until this day. It's always easier for Blackmagic Design to develop the editing features in, in Resolve than it is for Adobe to add really advanced color features. I released a video at the time showing uh, 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 DaVinci Resolve working on my wife's Mac 11-inch MacBook Air, which was a very low-end system at the time, but I showed that it can work and it actually played and I did some color correction. I'm, I'm sure it, it wasn't perfect at the time, but the idea for, to, for Resolve 12 to run on an 11-inch MacBook Air, this is a standard MacBook Air with nothing special. And weirdly enough, I can grade and edit on the MacBook Air. So if I come to this image and change the gain here, and maybe just lower the gamma, it's actually kind of responsive. Another important thing that happened in 2015 was that they changed the naming scheme of Resolve. Because you see, uh, uh, Resolve had two different versions. So there was a paid version of Resolve and a free version. However, they, they switched the name now because Prior to 2015, it was um, DaVinci Resolve was a paid product, and there was DaVinci Resolve Lite that was a free product. However, Blackmagic Design noticed, just like a lot of other people, is that there's nothing light about Resolve Lite. I mean, it had Resolve, the tracker, the color science, the editing features, the multicam, the, uh, the 
like it, it was mind boggling to call this product light. So they switched the naming. So DaVinci Resolve itself became a free product. So now Resolve is a free product. Then they introduced DaVinci Resolve Studio, which is a paid product. So we still have the paid and the free product. However, the naming changed. And now DaVinci Resolve in itself is officially a free product. Then in 2015, uh, Blackmagic, Design, Blackmagic Design released Fusion 8 uh, for Windows and Mac because Fusion at the time was also Linux only. Uh, and now uh, there is a version for of Fusion for Windows and Mac that was released in 2015. Of course, uh, Fusion users were very happy. This opened the door to all filmmakers uh, to be able to use Fusion regardless of what platform they're using. So Linux, Mac, or Windows. Then in 2016, Resolve 12.5 was released. Let me take a look at my notes. And then in 2016, things got a bit scary. Blackmagic Design bought Fairlight. Why is that big news? Fairlight is an audio system. It, just an audio system, it's as simple as that. It, it does many of the things that other audio systems do. However, what is very special about Fairlight is, Fairlight is built from the ground up for the film industry. You see, historically, uh, filmmakers had to use the same tools that musicians used. So musicians use a particular software. I don't want to mention any particular software, but whatever software that was built basically for music production, uh, film producers had to adopt that system and work with it and make it work for film production. However, Fairlight was built from the ground up only for film production. All the features it, it has are built specially for film production. And that made it extremely powerful. I mean, um, on the software part, it, it can fill, you can add up to 1,000 tracks in it. Now, the word Fairlight at the time referred to this controller. So this controller was sold with a software. So Blackmagic Design acquired Fairlight, and now they owned the software, which will later be added to Resolve. Notice at this point that Blackmagic Design had all the ingredients ready. So they have... Uh, DaVinci Resolve, they have Fusion, they have Fairlight, they have the Edit tab being advanced all the time. So they have all the ingredients and all they needed to do is to bake the cake. Then in 2017, it actually happened with Resolve 14, uh, the Fairlight tab was introduced into Resolve. The, the most important thing about adding the Fairlight tab to, to, to Resolve is that it was really integrated. If you edited something in the edit page, the edits you make are automatically reflected in the Fairlight tab. And anything you change in the Fairlight tab is automatic, without you doing anything, automatically reflected in the Edit tab. It wasn't simply as like, you know, gluing two things together and calling it a day. It's not like it was just added. It was really integrated into Resolve. And I remember using it and I was like, that's crazy. The amount of work that went into making Fairlight sync in real time with every single change you make in the edit tab. I'm not sure what to say about all that. Like we're really lucky to have uh, black magic design <laughs> working on this, frankly. So these things were in, so Fairlight was included into Resolve and it worked in real time and there was no syncing or no, nothing needed to happen. You change something in one tab, it appears on the other. Because, you know, with other softwares of the time, if if you change something in one software, you have to save your project, then tell it, you know, send it to the other software, then your computer will go open the other software and the other software will show you the edit. However, it doesn't exactly work like the other, the, the original one you worked with, the playhead is not in the same position. And if you change something in one software, you need to close it, save it, go to the other one, reload it for it to appear. But the level of integration that Blackmagic Design did was just unbelievable. Then in 2017, Blackmagic Design dropped the price of uh, DaVinci Resolve Studio, so the paid version of Resolve, from $1,000 to $300, which simply means that um, if you wanted to use Resolve Studio at the time, you had to do the, you had to go through the very weird process of, should I buy DaVinci Resolve or a Bluetooth speaker? 
then in 2018, Fusion was added to Resolve. And again, it was with the same level of unbelievable integration where everything works together. And um, so Fusion was even added into the free version of Resolve because there were rumors that it, at the time that it would only work on the paid version, but it was totally added to the free version of Resolve. And uh, now the sky, I'm, I'm writing some stuff here now. The sky is the starting point, not the limit. I'm not sure if this is good, but you know. Here's the deal. In the 80s, if you meet someone who worked in Hollywood, the main difference between you and him would be that he have access to softwares and to systems that you do not have access to. However, now, if you meet someone who works in Hollywood, you're only limited by your imagination. Of course, he has $2 million more than you to spend on other stuff, but the point is, uh, uh, you, at least when it comes to softwares, you're practically using the same thing. Then in 2019, the cut tab was added. Uh, I made an entire video about the cut tab called cut versus edit, but it's simply designed to speed up the initial phase of, of the editing process. Uh, you can watch the video. And finally, in 2020, Resolve 17 was uh, released that it introduced the color warper, the HDR wheels, and it added support for Apple Silicon computers. Is Resolve complete now? I don't know. I don't think so. I think Blackmagic Design still um, uh, can still do a lot of things with, with Resolve. I'm sure they have a lot of great ideas. Uh, however, how do you think Resolve will uh, progress in the future? Leave your ideas in the comments. So, thank you for watching. If you like this, please visit us at filmsimplified.com where you can join our free DaVinci Resolve Crash Course that is designed for the absolute beginner and will take you through every tab in Resolve, teaching you everything, color, edit, fusion, the basics of all the stuff for free. Thank you. Filmsimplified.com